Hey, guess what? Come here. Come closer. I got a little secret for you. The Vikings are seven and one. Welcome to Locked On Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You like it. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their Prize Picks projection, you can go win up to 10 times your money on first entry. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with promo code Locked On. It's prizepicks.com, promo code Locked On. I am your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. Show is on Twitter at Locked On Vikings. And thank you so much for making. Locked on Vikings is your first listen of the day each and every day, especially game days, because we have a win to break down the seventh of the year. The Vikings just can't stop stacking fake feeling wins. It's another one, maybe the ugliest of them all. And there's plenty of downs to go with the ups. But I I struggle with whether or not to call this win earned because of how well the defense played and stuff. And, and we'll get into it. I'm like genuinely conflicted. But. The headline is the Vikings won 20 to 17. And what I feel about how like earned it is or isn't doesn't change how it affects the standings, which is the Vikings lead the NFC North by four and a half games. They get a win. Both the Bears and Packers lost. They're both the Bears and Packers are tied. So the magic number is the same. Um five now. Five combined Vikings wins and Packers losses. Slash Vikings wins and Bears losses. Um That clinches the division, and there's actually enough games for that to happen. If the Vikings win both of their next two games, which would be Buffalo and Dallas, be kind of hard, but if they did that, and if the Packers and Bears both lost their next two games, the Vikings would take the field on Thanksgiving against the Patriots with a chance to clinch the division. It is that close (laughs) to clinch the division on Thanksgiving. That is actually technically possible. Probable? No, it would require quite a bit, Uh, but... That it is technically possible is uh, a statement in and of itself. But the thing is, a road win, even one that doesn't come too easy, even one where you don't think that they should play as well as a team with their record should play, is still, I think, something to hang your hat on. So let's recap it here real quick, and then we'll talk offense, and then we'll talk defense. Um, It is a fairly simple game recap. Drive one. There was a Justin Jefferson only touchdown drive, which with a touchdown to Justin Jefferson, his only his second of the year. um, But the Vikings have been pretty good in the red zone, like very good in the red zone, actually. So that's not like a problem. It's just other people are catching the touchdowns. Um, And then a total meltdown for the next two and a half quarters. Just utterly disgusting. (laughs) It was horrible. Um, It it was kind of this slow burn where the Vikings found themselves down 17 to 7. They gave up 17 unanswered all the way through the third quarter. Um, probably the biggest commander's highlight in all of that is a ref ball touchdown, which we'll talk about, but, um, I'm sure you saw at least the highlight if you missed the game of a, a horribly underthrown Taylor Heineke pass. Cam Bynum is going to intercept it. He's tracking it underneath to intercept it. He gets blown up by the back judge who was just trying to get out of the way and doing as bad a job as possible to the point where people are like that had to be on purpose, which like I see where they're coming from, but Probably not. You'd have to like really put on the tinfoil hat and say that there's a conspiracy to make the commanders look good when they're for sale, which makes just enough sense to be funny, (laughs) but I don't buy it. Um, Either way, instead, it turns into touchdown Curtis Samuel. Um, That was the biggest offensive play of the day for the commanders, and it was very clearly not earned by them. One of the least lucky things that I've ever seen happen to the Vikings defense. Um, some part uh, through the game, sometime through the game, Cameron Dancer goes down. He gets an ankle injury to go with his neck injury. He was questionable going into the game, anyways. Uh, Caleb Evans comes in, not Andrew Booth. I'm sure I'll get a bunch of questions about that on Twitter Tuesday, but the answer to that is uh, Caleb Evans is better than a- Andrew Booth right now. Um, and he kind of showed that. He got a key fourth down stop, a bunch of really good plays in the run. I thought Evans played pretty well in relief for the rest of the game as Dancer went down with an ankle injury. But they kind of squandered that opportunity. They get the ball, short field, and they go three and out, punt it right back. 
and then a long touchdown drive highlighted by, I believe on that drive, was the Taylor Heineke spin move out of Eric Kendricks um, and touchdown commanders. So you're down 17-7. That brings us to that point. Kind of as the Vikings are trying to claw back into this. I mean, you're down 17-7. At that point, it was the third quarter. You get this long, gorgeous go ball to Justin Jefferson. Kirk Cousins gets takes a huge shot on it um, and actually has to go out for a play, but it sets up the Vikings in easy field goal range. They'll end up kicking that. And then on the way back, Taylor Heineke throws a horribly overthrown, skied interception right into the lap of Harrison Smith, his third straight game with a pick. Uh, and then two plays later, the Vikings are scoring a touchdown on a beautiful post wheel to uh, Dalvin Cook. Just a total dot, one-handed catch by Dalvin Cook as well. Just an awesome play, and suddenly we're back. 17-17, tied. Um, Vikings get a stop, then they drive down into point-blank range, but they go a little too fast, and they're lining up to kick with a minute 40 left to go. So that's a lot of time for the commanders to go back and answer. But on the kick, the commanders commit a pretty boneheaded penalty by knocking over the long snapper. He counts as a defenseless player. You're not allowed to do that. Gives the commanders a fresh or the Vikings a fresh set of downs, and that allows them to kill just enough clock to win. Really big situational masters moment at the end. And for me, the headline of this game is situational masters works. That that has been a motto of Kevin O'Connell since he got here. And I think if there is one thing you can point to that has had the most impact on the Vikings season, it is the situational masters thing. Everybody knows how much time is on the clock. Everybody understands it. There, it doesn't feel like this is the first time they've thought about, well, there's a minute 40 left and we have a first and goal. What do we do? And they have one timeout because the commanders blew a couple timeouts on dumb stuff earlier in the half. With Zimmer, especially, that always felt like they were improv- They were going, okay, wait, what is the situation? All right, And they were like thinking through it for the first time. With O'Connell, it feels like they have a very key, like, all right, this is the situation. And he called it a no score situation, which is a pretty interesting idea. They were not to score. Um, Dalvin Cook got handoffs. He was not to score it. He danced around in the backfield, ate up as many seconds off the clock as he could. At that point, it was about getting that clock to zero. They ended up getting, by the time the commanders took over, it it was uh, 12 seconds and a three point deficit. And that's just too far to go in 12 seconds. They only got one playoff. So Vikings win 20 to 17 after spending a decent amount of the game not only trailing, but looking like they deserved to trail, like they deserved to lose. And they pulled it together in the fourth quarter and kind of overcame that. The question still remains, can they put a whole one together? And they haven't, but they've kind of been winning anyways. And that can can be pretty exciting. Um, I want to go a little deeper into offense and defense. Um, but first things first, let's talk about prize picks. Prize picks is a, a really great alternative to daily fantasy. I don't like daily fantasy. I don't like putting together a whole lineup and having to enter a pool with 6,000 people. I like being able to just like have a few takes and you can just kind of have, uh, you, there's a prize picks projection and you just more than or less than, and you put two, two to five players together and you can win up to 10 times your money if you are correct. If you go to prizepicks.com or download the app, you can get started right now. And if you enter promo code locked on, you can get up to a hundred dollars of a 100% instant deposit match. That means if you put in a hundred bucks, they will match that and give you a hundred bucks on top of it. Put in 50, get 50, etc. And it's not just football. It's everything under the sun, basketball, hockey, all of those, but they've got like cricket and tennis too. So go check out prize picks. Get the app or go to prizepicks.com, promo code locked on to get your 100% instant deposit match up to $100. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day. For your second listen, check out Locked On Sports Today. It's the sort of flagship all sports show um, on Locked On, daily show just like this one, but it's covering everything. Go check it out. Also, check me out on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash NFL. I will be breaking down a whole bunch of film from this one um, in a way that, you know, you can't really do on a podcast that... I can use film and visuals in a way that is just a little bit more um, accessible than like the mostly audio medium that this is. Um, Let's start with the bad news. All right, well, we'll get through. We'll eat our dinner before dessert because the defense, I thought, had an outstanding day. Offense, not so much. (laughs) The... So let's start with the offense. Um, But there is a, a lot of good on the offense. Like, there's enough. And I think the big story 
it, that I haven't mentioned at all yet is TJ Hawkinson's debut going about as well as you could ask. Nine catches, 70 yards. They used him and they used him often. Now he credits a couple of people in the building, David Blau uh, in particular, who is also with him in Detroit. Um, for being able to get up to speed and all of that stuff. But we kind of talked about it in the week that it's like, that's not impossible. And even TJ Hawkinson in his introductory presser kind of said, you know, football, f- football is football. I know how to run a dig route, right? I know how to block for duo. Like I, I know, you know, that this is like stuff that has been universal to him for a while. Um, so part of it is that he's working off a better, I mean, he's not learning from scratch, right? He's not a rookie, but also that's still a gargantuan effort. Like, I don't want to take away from the effort that is. I just kind of want to demonstrate this is totally possible if you work your ass off at it. And it's very clear that he did. Uh, He was, you know, assignment sound and all that stuff. I do think he messed up on one run play, um, but you're not going to kill him over that. Um, And then also just being a really good route runner, being an unbelievable separator for a tight end. I mean, I thought Irv Smith was like a pretty good separator for a tight end. Hawkinson puts him to shame in that category. And I mean, we knew that like the Hawkinson has made Pro Bowls, like of course. Uh, but or I think he made one Pro Bowl. I don't know. He could make more. But it was a lot of open over the middle, a lot of separating against linebackers and even sometimes against slot corners. Um, it, it was, you know, catching everything, nine targets, nine catches sound in that way, which we've had tight end drop problems all year from both Smith and Johnny Munt. Um, the the impact of Hawkinson, too, is beyond just that production. There were great blocks. There was a great long Adam Thielen play uh, early in the game that had, I think, Montez Sweat one-on-one with TJ Hawkinson, and he held up. You don't get that from a tight end very often. Um, all of that adds up on, on the post-wheel touchdown to Dalvin Cook. Who was running the post? TJ Hawkinson. And you usually can't ask a tight end to do that because he's got to be fast to run that post and to really threaten the safety enough that he can't play over the top of the wheel or midpoint it. You got to be fast. And and Hawkinson was fast enough for that. So he has his role, obviously fantastic play by Dalvin Cook and Kirk Cousins, but there's that influence, that effect. And I think we saw that from Hawkinson. So I, I, I will maintain, look, Hawkinson's stat line, nothing to sneeze at. We will take nine for 70 all day long. Very happy with that. But the impact is still undersold by that stat line. And you should be really excited about that. But not to be overshadowed is Justin Jefferson at 115 yards, including, I think, like a 10 or 15 yard uh, jet sweep on a third down. Jefferson was Jefferson. They decided to shadow him with Benjamin St. Just all day, which was really interesting. St. Just did a lot better than I thought he would. um, But ultimately, he could, you know, you can't hang for the whole game, right? Gives up a touchdown in a contested catch situation. He actually forces an interception in a Hail Mary situation. You see one pick on Kirk Cousins' stat line. That was an, or not Hail Mary, but it was an end zone shot with like 14 seconds to go at the end of the half. Uh, And a a ball you'd throw 10 times out of 10. Justin Jefferson one-on-one in the end zone with 14 seconds left. You're taking that. And if it's incomplete, you know, you kick a field goal, you're fine. Because they were at like the 14-yard line. Um... Or no, like 20-ish? I don't know. They were close enough to kick, for sure. So take an end zone shot with 14 seconds left and try, you know, give it a shot, right? And it just tips wrong and it bounces into a commander's hands. But that shouldn't make you shy away. And O'Connell confirmed after the game. He was like, yeah, we came over to the sideline and I, and I, you know, he said, I'm glad Kirk Cousins was throwing that. And I agree, like, you want him to be throwing that ball. Um, But good play by St. Juice. He got his licks in as well. But ultimately, he got beat down the sideline for that long go ball, which was a huge chunk of the yardage. Um, And he just, he got beat a a few too many times. I want to say like seven, eight catches for Jefferson. Most of them with St. Juice in coverage. Um, But, so that's like kind of where the good stuff ends. And then you had this O-line, like, disaster class. Um, they just could not on the interior handle the quickness of Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne. The edges did okay. I thought Darisaw uh, looked good, if anything, or I didn't notice him, which is probably like probably for a good reason. Um, same with Brian O'Neill, but the other guys, Ingram was cooked a lot. Ezra Cleveland had a horrific day. He was the one I noticed the most. Um, Bradbury had his licks as well. All of the interior guys just got screwed over by those defensive tackles, and there was penetration constantly. So that meant no run game. Dalvin Cook did what he could, and I thought he he showed plenty of wiggle, and I thought he maximized the space um, as as well as you can hope. 
but when you're getting contacted at the mesh point every single play, there's only so much you can do as a running back. You cannot be that bad on the offensive line and hold that hostage. And I thought the offensive line held the offense hostage here. Um, so look, that gave Kirk Cousins a lot to deal with. He was under fire all day. I think somewhere I saw he, he took 11 hits. That's too many, including the one that that ends up knocking the wind out of him. I, no long-term injury doesn't sound like, but um, he did get the wind knocked out of him, had to go out for a play. Uh, and he had to make a lot of throws under duress. He had to do a lot of pocket manipulation. This was a high degree of difficulty game for uh, for Kirk Cousins. Also, if you're not TJ Hawkinson or Justin Jefferson, you just weren't open. Adam Thielen and KJ Osborne, I thought, had pretty bad games. Um, and so finding that among that, like this was a high degree of difficulty game for Kirk Cousins, and I thought he did admirably there. Um, not perfect, had an underthrow, had some times where maybe he could have handled this situation differently or that one. Um, and it kind of depends on what narrative you want to push. But ultimately, I would use the word admirable under the circ like. Under the circumstances, admirable is the word that comes to mind for, for Kirk Cousins' this game. Um, but overall, offensively, kind of an opening drive in a fourth quarter, and everything else was bad. Uh, they've got to figure out how to put together a complete game. They have If they're going to get a surprise on defense, and I, I kind of said they don't, they don't know what they're going to see on defense, and I do think, uh, if, if I rem remember looking at it, but i got to check this, my live eye is never going to be as, as complete. Four-man rushes. Um, four man surfaces, you know, they're not doing the stuff Miami did and they just had too many horses up front. And when your D tackles are beating the interior line that bad as an offense, you have to take less than two and a half quarters to figure out what to do about it. Now, I don't know if they changed something in the fourth quarter or if Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne, who played a lot of snaps, if I, if I remember, um, I, maybe they just got tired, right? And then you could block them and then things started working the way they were supposed to. But like, that is a problem you need to learn how to solve. And what I didn't see that I wanted to see were sprint outs. Um, sprint outs are where the quarterback takes it and it's kind of like a rollout, but, the, but without the play action fake where the line and the quarterback all move to one side and, and you can kind of get the action flowing that way really helps the offensive line, especially against interior guys. Make those big dudes run. I wanted to see a little bit more of making those big dudes run. The Vikings, I think, instead opted for screen game to try to get the defense to back off, and their screens were just getting red. The The commanders just knew it, and they could play really aggressive underneath because the things that punish aggressive underneath coverage require blocking to set up, and they couldn't block it. And so the commanders could just sort of play YOLO ball all day on defense and sort of shut you down until the guys got tired and they couldn't get that pressure anymore. And then suddenly you could punish it and, you know, go ball on third down for Justin Jefferson for like 50 yards. That's what I think happened. Of course, I'll, I'll check in on all of that and I'll, I'll tell you what I think on especially the Wednesday shows when I do a lot of that. And I am curious to see really just how much impact that um, problem up front had, but my opinion going in is the guards held the offense hostage and that's why they didn't score more. Well, good commander's defense and credit to them, especially credit to Allen and Payne. Um, but if you want to be a, a serious Super Bowl contender, you got to do a little better than that. But on defense, that was a complete game and a complete thought. And I'm very excited to go deep into it. Uh, but first, let me talk to you about a good old gramble. I made some grambles on this one on, on my You Betcha segment. I always throw out four or five prop bets. Um, I, my favorite was the Justin Jefferson touchdown and Vikings win double. I got that at, I think, like one plus 140, so more than double my money, and we got it. Um, also, stuff like Heineke throwing an interception, which was minus 162, so not great value, but per a particularly likely thing, and lo and behold, it happened. You want to get start stacking some of those wins, you can go to bet online it's a one-stop shop for all things grambling you can also of course bet on basketball uh hockey tennis golf whatever you can bet right in the middle of a game my favorite is whenever the chiefs are on prime time when they are inevitably down in the second quarter always bet their money line they'll find a way <laughs> i actually took them minus two and a half at halftime against the titans they'll find a way always, uh, in a game that they started minus 14 and a half. So you can kind of manipulate the odds to your favor that way, as long as you, you trust the comeback and who wouldn't with Patrick Mahomes. Find all that stuff at betonline.net where the game starts. I don't think I'm exaggerating if I call this game by the defense, the best one of the season for them. 
I even like it better than their week one game against the Packers because that felt like it could have been fluky. And and maybe the Packers just aren't good because they like are sucking right now. They just like couldn't move the ball against the Lions, which is the worst defense in the league and like historically bad. But this one felt like domination, especially up front with Daniil Hunter and Zadarius Smith. Both of those guys showed up in a big way. Uh, two sacks for Daniil Hunter, all kinds of hits and, and disruptions and stuff. Um, no Dalvin Tomlinson in this game. And you could really tell that they missed it. I thought they ran at a pretty good clip, but not a good enough clip. It was like three and a half, which f- there are like enough five and seven yard runs in there where it feels like, ah, man, they're kind of running the ball on us. But there were enough stuffs in there that I'm pretty happy with the run defense. And that is credit to James Lynch and Jonathan Bullard. Of course, Harrison Phillips um, and Kyrie Tonga, who is, you know, the, the practice squatter they they took from the Bears, who's a big, strong guy, who actually had another big splash of uh, pressure that that forced an errant throw. Um, I, I thought the defensive line was really, really fantastic. And the commander's O-line is as much a problem, probably more of a, of a problem than the Vikings O-line is. So that was to be expected. But when you would have a bad unit against a good unit, you expect them to dominate, Right. And that the Vikings dominated is exactly what proves that they're a good unit. And and you're going to hear a lot of this, I think, this this game. Well, God, it was just Taylor Heineke, right? Well, you know, the commanders have a bad O-line. Of course, the D-line did well. And everybody doesn't get to dominate against a bad O-line. Only the good ones do. And so dominating against that bad O-line is evidence of being good. Um, If they were just a little better, yeah, then you could kind of say, well, strength of competition. But dominating... That's exactly what you, that's what you want. You can't do what's more than dominating, right? Dominating more. (laughs) Um, So really happy with the defensive line. Really happy with Jordan Hicks in this game. Jordan Hicks had a day, a lot of disruptions, a lot of big plays, knifing in through run plays, shooting a lot of gaps. He was sound in coverage. I think a couple of them went, went past his zone, but it's a far cry from what was happening against Philadelphia or Detroit or New Orleans. Um, It was... A, a lot better spaced over the middle. Um, Eric Kendricks, not as good of a day. <laughs> I, he was still Eric Kendricks in the run, and he, he's still a very like sound veteran player. But I think the only thing I can think of in this game is him not wrapping up Taylor Heineke and just getting shook out of his shoes by a spin move. You can't let that happen to you, man. That's going to be what you're remembered for th- this time. And, well, yep, that's how the cookie crumbles. <laughs> um. And then moving on to the secondary, uh, uh, Patrick Peterson was Patrick Peterson. I think he gave up one catch over the middle, and that was like it. Uh, Good play from the safeties. Of course, Harrison Smith on it for the interception. Cam Bynum should have had the other interception, but then you had that ref ball thing, which I am going to circle back to. Um, And then the other corner spot, you had Cameron Dantzler, who goes out in this game. Also, decent game from Shannon Sullivan. I I liked what I saw from Shannon Sullivan in this one. Um, But... Cameron Dantzler, who goes out in this game after he suffers that ankle injury, and who comes in? A Caleb Evans. Now, I am sure that I'm going to get, I, I, like I said earlier, a ton of mailbag questions. Where is Andrew Booth? Let me get out in front of it. Um, Andrew Booth is not better than a Caleb Evans. There's your answer. We thought he might be based on draft pedigree, and I think he had pretty good reasons to, but a lot of stuff changes between college and the NFL, and right now, as of this moment, Andrew Booth based on what we saw in preseason and stuff, probably way too grabby and way too susceptible to getting flags. I think of that a Caleb Evans who gets a fourth and one stop pass breakup on Terry McLaurin. That's a holding penalty if it's Booth. And I know that's not fun because you don't want the second rounder to be outplayed by a fourth rounder, but that's where it is right now. And can Andrew Booth get better? Of course. And he was always going to be the kind of guy that needed to get rid of that problem before he would be viable to put on the field. Um, and so a red shirt year for him always totally made sense to me. And it's really cool that we have a young, also rookie corner that can step in and be the backup in the meantime. So nobody's given up on Andrew Booth, right? But he's been injured. He's missed a lot of time and he's got the grabbies. Can't put that dude on the field. We'll see you next year. And that's okay. No shame in that at all. Um, man, this could have been a 10 point performance. And, and that's what frustrates me. I am usually not one to be like that was ref ball right and and talk about the refs a bunch but i think (laughs) we got to talk about this one (laughs) because that was one of the most egregious things i've ever seen um and i think the vikings ultimately were 
the victims of bad ref luck more than they were the beneficiaries of good ref luck, which has not been the case up to this point in the season. So, you know, the Vikings, gosh, they're getting lucky and they're barely winning. Well, now they're getting unlucky and they're barely winning. To me, that feels like a step forward because this was an unlucky game, all things considered. Yeah, they had a couple of other breaks in there, but they definitely, the commanders got way more breaks than the Vikings did, if you ask me. And I believe the biggest offensive play on the whole commander's offense was this uh, back judge blowing up Cam Bynum. Now, that back judge, his responsibility is to get out of the way, and he panics and he runs directly into the player. That is inexcusable, right? Now, under the rules, you're, they're going to say, well, you know, th there is no redo to that play. The rule book treats the refs the same way you treat the pylon or the goalpost. If a player runs into the goalpost and falls down, you don't say goalpost interference and redo the down, right? The ref counts the same way as that or, or counts like the grass does. If you trip over the turf monster, you don't say turf interference. That's the way the ref counts on the rule book. Sure, that's the way it needs to be enforced. Whatever, that's the way the rules go. But that judge himself is a person who does get judged and criticized. There is a system by which they decide who officiates playoff games and stuff. That should disqualify him from all of that immediately. That is such an egregious error to get in the way of a play. Your goal is to keep the game moving and to not impede play and then to see penalties and stuff. But that's how refs are trained. And so to not get in the way of, or to, to not be able to get out of the way of that is completely egregious. And for that to be such a swingy play. Look, the Vikings give up 17 points. Good day, all things considered. Against a bad offense, you can kind of say, well, that's probably the expectation. But it really should have been less than that because of this exact play. That usually when you say that, you know, the, there was one in the Seahawks game that happened uh, later in the day. Tyler Lockett commits what looked to me like OPI goes uncalled and it's a touchdown, but that was first down and goal. So if they do call that, there's still a chance that Seattle still scores. So it, it, you can't credit the entire touchdown. You have to credit some of the touchdown and EPA expected points is a good way to sort of parse that out. In this one, they were on the 50, which has an expected points. Let's, like, let's do that calculus. That has an expected point value of under three, call it two and a half, maybe two. Um, and if you think about it from like an expected points, well, sure, you're like so likely to get a field goal. You're not really like guaranteed a field goal like you would be when you're at the 20. Um, and so most teams will score a field goal, but not all of them. So call it two and a half, two. And that turns into seven. And it should have been interception, which would be expected points the other way or call it zero because you would have been pretty backed up at interception on like the three. So call it zero expected points. So not only does it bring a two to a seven, it brings what should have been a zero to a seven. So you can really can credit an entire touchdown to that one play, which was not only not the Vikings fault, but from a process angle, the Vikings played that very well. Jonathan Bullard got a pressure that forced a very bad throw. And so like they did kind of earn in a sense that interception by pressure influencing the throw. And then Cameron Bynum plays underneath it. Now he's got to catch it. He's not guaranteed to. Maybe he drops that if the ref doesn't get there, right? So there's that possibility to work in. But you can kind of say the defense really gave up 10 points and, and it really does track for me in a way that it doesn't usually when you blame refs for things. Um, but like that, the Vikings earned a very good day on defense. Um, and, and any excuses you make can kind of be smoothed over by saying, yeah, but it was only 10 points. And holding a bad team to 10 points is what you expect a good defense to do. And they did what good defenses do. You make with that whatever you make of that. If you want to say it was just one game or whatever, go for it. But the Vikings defense did to a bad offense what good defenses do to bad offenses. And that is something to absolutely be proud of. So... 20 to 17, final score. Some bad, some good, feels unearned and all of that stuff, but they're seven and one. And now they got to go face the Bills. That'll be a really fun one to break down. But I'm not done talking about this game. Tomorrow we'll do the mailbag. Um, so send me your questions at Luke Brown NFL at Locked On Vikings. You can send emails to Locked On Vikings Podcast at gmail.com. There's a Google form in the show notes or just leave a YouTube comment if you're watching on YouTube. Um, we'll do that. Wednesday we'll do some tape breakdown and then the rest of the week we'll talk about the Bills. It's here, the final, the Stefan Diggs, Justin Jefferson stare off, swag off. I don't know what you want to call it, uh, but we'll talk about that all throughout the week. I'll see y'all tomorrow. And as always, 
Skull.